It is crazy to think that in this modern day of the 21st century that there are still generals, leaders around the world that still want people to bow down to them, praise them, and that just exert their power and authority. Now, this is obviously old footage from about six or eight years ago when Kim Jong-il was the, the leader of North Korea, and his son is now in, in rule there. But these people are expected to bow down and give praise to their leader when he's really done nothing. <laughs> And this guy is, travels around the world to help people, and yet it's just amazing that the very first thing, as you watch throughout the documentary, the very first thing that they're expected to do, or their life is on the line, is to bow and give praise to their leader. Now, it's crazy, crazy to think that when we read in the scriptures and we look through history, that not really a lot has changed through the centuries. We go back 2,600 years during this time of Daniel in the series that we've been in, and we see this very arrogant, self-righteous king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar, who is just so full of himself that he really does the same exact thing that we see some of these leaders doing today. Not a whole lot has changed. And today we're going to pick up in part four, as we're going to be looking at today in Daniel chapter three, and just see just Nebuchadnezzar just do some of the most crazy things as he expects all of his royal subjects to bow down before an image that, that he sets up. And so today we're going to continue in our series just talking about standing up when the world bows down. Now we've got a lot of text to cover today because I just want to go through the entire chapter because there's just some really kind of humorous and unique things that we will just see when a leader just really demands allegiance and wants people to, to come and bow down to him. And so we're also going to see today that Daniel is not really mentioned at all in this entire chapter. Um, it is believed that Daniel may be um, off out of the country on royal business or he is right beside the king um, and he's not expected to participate in some of what's going to take place in this, this section. of the. But we are going to see these three guys that we've looked at. Um, I call them the three amigos um, because th these three guys are just outstanding alongside of, of Daniel. And, and in this chapter, they're going to go by their Babylonian names. There's a shift that has taken place now. It's believed that this possibly could be 15 years later from what we looked at last week. So when we kicked off this series, we talked about how Daniel and these three guys, his three com companions were, were around 15 years old. So they're probably about 30 years old about now. Um, and Daniel and his companions just they have just an impeccable record in serving the king and, and just obeying God. So we're picking up in Daniel chapter 3. If you have a Bible, you can follow along. It'll be up here on the screens as well, or you can follow along on the app. Um, Daniel chapter 3, starting in verse 1, it says this. It says, King Nebuchadnezzar made a gold statue 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Now, let's just pause here for a moment. Now, this is what the king is doing, all right? He, he wants everybody to recognize him as the leader. And so just we looked at last week, as Michael shared with us last week, about asking us, what kingdom do we live in? All right, we just talking about how Daniel, and you know, God gave Daniel the interpretation of this incredible dream. And, and so one moment, you know, the king is giving honor to the one God that can only reveal all these things. And in this dream, which we didn't look at, what happens is that there's this, there's this statue that he sees in his dream, and the head of it is gold. And then it's recorded in chapter 3. I don't have it up here on the screens. The head of the statue was fine gold. Its chest and arms were silver. Its belly and thighs were bronze. And its legs were iron. And its feet were a combination of iron and baked clay. And then he sees this rock come out of the mountains and destroys this, this statue. And a kingdom is set up, which represents the kingdom of God that will last for eternity. And, and just how the king was just really troubled by this, this dream. And so he demanded that all of his top leaders, they tell him what the dream was, this, this impossible task. Well, it just seems that we pick up in chapter 3 that this dream that troubled him so much is still troubling him. To where now he wants to make sure that his kingdom, his dynasty goes on and on. So rather than just a statue having a head of gold, he makes this whole 90-foot statue of gold. Now, scholars say there wasn't enough gold back in Babylon to do that. So it was probably a, a wood or stone structure that was overlaid with gold. But now he puts up this huge image out there on this plain of Dura where everybody can see it for miles. 
All right, so he wants everybody to know of his great accomplishments, and he is hoping that his, his subjects will be, you know, report to him and bow to him and all these things. And so he sets up this huge, huge image of gold. This picks up in verse 2. Then he sent messengers to the high officers, all of his key leaders, all right? His officials, his governors, the advisors, the treasurers, the judges, magistrates, and all the provincial officials to come to the dedication of the statue that he had set up. And so all these officials came and stood before the statue King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So all these guys, like, I want all my key people to come and be around this image so they can see this great thing that I've done. Verse 4. Then he has this herald. This herald shouts out, now that they're all there, people of all races and nations and language, listen to the king's command. So he's, he's conquered all these people, all right, all these different lands, including Israel, Judah, the people of God. He's got all these different people from Egypt and everywhere else around there now are subject to him. And he gives this command, verse 5, When you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and other musical instruments, in other words, it's a royal orchestra or a royal band that he's got, um, bow to the ground to worship King Nebuchadnezzar's gold statue. Anyone who refuses to obey will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. So what he's doing here is he's got this huge 90-foot statue, and right next to it is this big fiery furnace. And you can see the smoke, and this furnace was probably used. They were, they were really good with metal work, and so it was probably used for melting ores and stuff. And so he's got this huge furnace just burning away, and now he's making this command. He's like so insecure as a leader, and he's so worried about losing his kingdom. He's like, I want all the people that are under my power. He's like the big dog in the world this time. He's like, I want everyone to come. And when you hear the musical instruments play, you are to bow down before this image. Or you'll be thrown into the blazing furnace. Verse 7. So, at the sound of the musical instruments, all the people, whatever their race or nation or language, bowed to the ground and worshipped the gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. All these people, they're all there, and they're all bowing down. Now, obviously, they're bowing down because they're fearful for their life, because it's either bow or go into the fiery furnace. But they all just give in, and they all bow down. Now, there's a couple different speculations on what this image was that King Nebuchadnezzar constructed. Some scholars suggest that it was an image of one of their main gods, their main idols, um, Nebo. And Nebo is this, 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 their, their main god, and that's where Nebuchadnezzar actually gets his name. It's Nebuchadnezzar, which means Nebo protect the throne. And so, so he, he's got this insecure name. He's like so worried. He's like, I'm Nebuchadnezzar. And, and he's maybe hoping that as he constructs his 90-foot statue of his, his idol god, they had many gods, this was one of them, that maybe Nebo, who he's named after, will protect his throne. And this way he's going to command that all the people that report to him, that are subject to his authority, his rule as king, will bow before this image. Other scholars suggest that it was a 90-foot image of King Nebuchadnezzar himself. That this wasn't a common thing for kings to do in the ancient world. But King Nebuchadnezzar, as you read through the scriptures and you read the history, this guy was just so self-absorbed. He was so focused on himself, insecure, so afraid that he might lose his kingdom, that it's possible that he constructed an image of himself. Because when you read chapter 2, which we looked at last week, the head was him. Daniel said the head, that golden head was you. Now he makes the entire thing out of gold. And it's, it's possible that there's this big image of himself he's got there for everybody to see for miles. He's like, guys, I want you to bow down to an image of me. Either way, it's still the same effect. He's trying to exhort his power, he's demanding allegiance. And as we saw in that video clip, there's even leaders that are still alive today that want you to bow before their image, to bow before them. They exercise out of their insecurity. They exercise their power. They want to be worshipped. Now for us, we kind of find that kind of an odd thing to do in our culture. Or do we? Because the first thing I think we can see here, the first thing I just want to suggest, point number one, is I want to suggest that we want to be worshipped like God. Now, I'm not saying that we're going to go around to each other saying, oh, great one, oh, you're so wonderful, you're awesome. You know, I'm not saying that. I mean, obviously, we don't, we don't do that like we see in some nations around the world. 
But I want to suggest that there's a part of us somewhere in our hearts, in these secret places, that we really want to be worshipped. Don't we? I mean, because worship means to give worth to something. And, and there's a part of us that just wants others to, to notice us, to recognize us, to give worth to us. And kind of like King Nebuchadnezzar, I mean, this guy goes all out to try to get attention and focus on him. And I think sometimes in our insecurities, in our brokenness, in our weakness, we go to extreme measures too sometimes to get focus on ourselves. Oh, I hope somebody will notice me and recognize me and give worth to me and admire me. Now, what's incredible is it really it's one of the oldest temptations in the book. When you go back to the book of Genesis, we see the very first thing when sin came into the world is God gave Adam and Eve everything they wanted in the garden. He said, you can eat anything you want. All these trees are here except for one. Right here in the middle of the garden. You stay away from this tree. Don't eat of its fruit or you will die. And then our enemy comes along, which we see he's really good at this, always at the beginnings of things. He comes along and he says, ah, what did God really say? Well, you know, and Eve repeats and he goes, is that really what he meant? I think this is what God means by what he said. What he really means is this, is that, is that if you eat of that fruit, I mean, look at it, it looks really good. And what he's not telling you is if you eat of it, you'll become like him. Just like him. And you'll know all these things, you'll know wisdom and knowledge. You can be like God. And in this moment, he gets them to take their eyes off of God and onto themselves. Just think you could have it all. We can focus on ourselves, and Satan trips them up, and they give in, they eat the fruit, and it's just been killing us ever since. And we become self-absorbed. I heard someone say, when man first invented the mirror, he lost his soul. Right? Because we become so focused on ourselves in, in this image, and we hope that others recognize us and notice us, and sometimes in our brokenness and our weakness, we will do whatever it takes Satan did the same thing with Jesus when he first started his ministry. He's out in the wilderness fasting and praying, and Satan shows up. He says, hey, here's the deal. All you got to do is bow down. Bow down and worship me. You can have all the kingdoms of the world. They were already his to begin with. But he's trying to trick him and twist, twist the word of God and get his eyes off the Father and get him onto himself. And I think it's just a real temptation we have today. I think we live in a time and a day when we are, we are self-addicted. I mean, I think I mean, we got the perfect technology to do it. Don't we? I mean, I mean, you know, it's a bad day when you go online and you're like, oh my gosh, nobody liked my post. I only got four comments instead of 150 comments. My life, God help me, Jesus, please. I'm so insignificant. <laughs> now, I know that's an extreme. But let's take a moment and be honest. How many times do you go on and look because you want somebody to notice? Right? I mean, we all do, right? Right? There's just a part of us that we just long for affection. We long for attention. We crave it. I mean, God purposely made us to be loved. But because of our brokenness, we, we, like Nebuchadnezzar, we go to these extremes to try to, to get people to notice us. And we'll just post all kinds of stuff. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with social media, but sometimes I just question our motives. And sometimes I think we become addicted to these things to where I just got to see that somebody comment. And I might even test you this week and just post something just to see how many comments I get. No. Just telling you ahead of time. But doesn't it throw us a curveball when we go on and we notice that not one person liked or commented on our post? There's just this little twinge inside. Maybe I'm not as significant as I really want to be. And it just affects us emotionally. Because the enemy just wants us to get our eyes off of God and get them onto ourselves. And I think we fall into the same trap that King Nebuchadnezzar did. Now we talked about how in this series, we talked about Daniel living in, a, in an upside down world. And the thing is, is that when it comes to the kingdom of God that we talked about last week, is that the kingdom of God is really flipped upside down. It's a great reversal. In our culture, we're told to push ourselves to the front. But in the kingdom, it says the first will be last. And the last will be first. And we're to descend into greatness, not ascend into greatness. And our model is Jesus Christ. 
And I love Philippians because in Philippians 2, for me, it's the pinnacle of the New Testament. It's just showing what Christ did for us. He had everything and he gave it up and humbled himself. And I like the way Eugene Peterson put it in the message paraphrase. This is what it says in Philippians 2, 3 and 4. It says, don't push your way to the front. Don't sweet talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside and help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourselves long enough to get off the internet. <laughs> and lend a helping hand. And I think that, you know, if Eugene Peterson wrote it today, he probably would have tied in something with our phones and computers because I think it pulls us away from biblical community. It pulls us away from the kind of relationships that God designed us for. And it really takes our focus off of God onto ourselves. Now, what's even tricky is that I've encouraged you guys to download version and use the Bible app. And what's really addicting is when you're on there reading the Bible and the text message comes up, it's like, oh my gosh, I got to respond, you know, or, or you see somebody posted and commented and it's like all of a sudden it just becomes a, a tension that we've got to be able to make some decisions on how we're going to respond to these things. Now, what's so funny when you just see how self-addicted we are, people do really stupid things on social media. Have you ever noticed that? I mean, you know, there's people that lost their jobs because of posts they've made. I was just reading some of these. I mean, I've seen some of these posts, all right? But I was reading some. You know, there was an ambulance driver that called their boss a scumbag. Got fired. There was a waitress that, that commented just on how terrible the, the people were that gave bad tips at their restaurant. Showed up at work next day. Pack up your stuff. You're done. Some people are crazy, you know? It's like one, one person, they lost their credit card and they posted, took a picture, say, hey, I found my credit card and they posted it on Facebook. <laughs> and then somebody commented, oh, I hate to see your bill. <laughs> Another person found their social security card. I haven't found this for years and posted it right there online. It's, it's crazy what people do because we are so focused on ourselves. And it's so easy to fall into the trap. I think the king Nebuchadnezzar fell into and wanting the accolades, wanting to be noticed. Now, I'm not saying there's nothing, you know, there's nothing wrong with just commenting and encouraging people and saying things like that, but I think a part of us longs for it in our brokenness to be worshipped like God. And King Nebuchadnezzar fell right into that trap, and it's easy for us as well. So let's go on. Daniel 3, verses 8 through 15, it goes on. It says, but some of the astrologers went to the king, because he's commanded everybody to bow down. These guys went to the string. Some translations will say Chaldeans. Okay, this was the people group that were typically the astrologers, all right? Some of the astrologers went to the king and informed on the Jews. In other words, they're just tattletales, okay? They said to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, long live the king. Now, how many of you have ever been around somebody that's just, you know, they're brown nosers, I mean, they're just always trying to get ahead, and they try to get ahead by putting someone else down. I mean, these guys are going to the king, and they're saying, hey, look, you're, you're little Jewish buddies, and you put in charge of all this stuff. I mean, they're, they're informing, they're tattletaling, and they're like, you know, long live the king. I mean, you're the best. You're, you're, you're awesome. Verse 10, it says, look, you issued a decree requiring all the people to bow down and worship the gold statue when they hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and other musical instruments. Verse 11, that decree also states that those who refuse to obey or to bow down must be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews, be specific here, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Okay, this is Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. We talked about those little Jewish names. Now they're going by their Babylonian names. Their names are changed. Okay, these three guys whom you have put in charge of the province of Babylon, they pay no attention to you. Now, come on. These guys have been faithful, loyal leaders. You know, you've been around people, they just stretch it. They pay no attention to you. It's like when they always say, don't ever say, you always and never. We always use the extremes. Like these guys, like they, they don't pay attention to you. They do pay attention to the king. All right, but these guys are just really, just kind of brown those in the king. They pay no attention to you, your majesty. They refuse to serve your gods and do not worship the gold statue you have set up. Verse 13 then Nebuchadnezzar flew into a rage 
and ordered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego he, he brought, to be brought before him. I mean, this guy, he's like so into himself. He's in a rage. And then when they were brought in, Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you refuse to serve my gods or worship the gold statue I have set up? You ever been around somebody that just demands your loyalty, just demands that you do something? I mean, he's like, is this true? Verse 15, he has a little bit of compassion in here. He says, I will give you one more chance to bow down and worship the statue I have made when you hear the sound of musical instruments. But if you refuse, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. And then what God will be able to rescue you from my power? I mean, this guy is on a power trip. And he is so insecure. It doesn't matter how loyal these guys have been and how much they've done for him. He wants to secure that his kingdom will last. And so he is like, you, you have to do this. You will. And if you don't, you'll be thrown into the fiery furnace. Verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that would be a hard place to be in. I mean, you, you can see right there next to this 90-foot gold statue, this blazing furnace just smoking away. And you are put in this situation and there's, these guys are just bold and they're confident and they're saying, your majesty, no disrespect, but we will never bow down to this image or any of your gods. Now those are pretty strong, confident words. Now I don't know about you, but sometimes when I, I read stories like this, it just kind of gets my mind going. And I just sit there and I think, you know, what would it have been like to be in their shoes in that moment? You know, and I was, I was just doing some research, just trying to figure out, you know, what would it have been like? How hard would it have been for these guys? And so I just went digging through some old archives, and I found some ancient footage of, of what it must have been like for these three guys. So let's just take a moment and watch the side screen. Quit screaming, quit screaming, I couldn't hear what he said. Yeah, but look, everybody's stop, stop. bowing down. Let's make sure we got this. Bow your heads. Burn them. He said bow or burn, is that right? I think so, yeah. I mean, between bow and burn, bow sounds pretty good. Yeah, I think we bow, no, let's no, bow. No, 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 we're not gonna bow down just because everybody else is. Uh, well, well, I mean, what about this? I'm in the royal band. Yeah, I think we do. Uh, if you're in a band or not, uh, and if it's between uh, bow and burning, I, We're going to burn. We're going to go oh, in together. I got arthritis in my knees. I can't bow down. I have to stay yeah. standing. Do you not oh, have yeah. arthritis in your knees? You're not that old. Uh, what would Daniel do? Uh, what would Daniel do? Why would Daniel Ooh, do? Listen, it's always we, about what would Daniel we do. We can ask him. Daniel! Yeah. Daniel! 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 He does not see you guys at all. He is nice and safe way up there. It's our call. God wants us to go. Not to bow. We're not going to bow. We'll go in together. Uh, I got to go to the bathroom. I already did. That is not going to help. It's his fault. Yes. He told us yes. to stand. He him. told us to stand. It was him. him. It was him. All it him. was all him. 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 <laughs> it's 
pretty amazing footage, isn't it? <laughs> I don't know how they shot that stuff. Oh, who says you can't have fun in church, right? <clears throat> now, what's interesting is I was reading some stuff this week on these three guys. These guys could have came up with all kinds of excuses. I mean, they could have went before the king. They said, King Nebuchadnezzar, look, we, we have been loyal to you at every point. Every point. And look, everyone else is all bowing down already. Isn't that enough? I mean, it could have, could have justified it, and it could have said, look, God, we're, you know, we're, we're going to go ahead and bow down, but we're not bowing down in our hearts, but we're going to go ahead and bow down because our life's at stake here. We're just going to just bend us just a little bit, okay? Or they could have said something like this. They could have said, God, well, you know, we're not going to be much good if we're just, you know, fried chicken. <laughs> you know, if we're just ashes, and, you know, we're not going to be very effective with Babylon, so it's better that we bow and live than go into the fiery furnace. They could have came up with all kinds of excuses, justified it, but they didn't. Not one bit. And as I mentioned in the first couple weeks, just how I really firmly believe, because these guys lived in biblical community, I mean, the Jewish, the, the way they lived, they lived as a community of faith. They encouraged one another. Even in the first century, the early church, they lived in biblical community, and they constantly were challenging each other with the word of God. Now, Isaiah was a prophet. I read from when we first started here. Isaiah was before the time of Daniel and these three guys, Okay, and he told them, he prophesied from God that there was going to be a time of captivity, that they were going to be taken away because of their disobedience. And I really believe that maybe these guys had heard these prophecies from Isaiah read to them, and which gave them the faith to stand strong in this moment. Let's look what it says here in Isaiah 43, verses 2 and 3. And this is all in regards to what God's going to do and what it's going to be like when they go into exile. And it says this, it says, When you pass through the waters... I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through what? Fire. The fire. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Why? For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, Israel your Savior. I firmly believe these guys knew the Word of God. And it gave them the confidence to stand in faith before the greatest ruler on the planet during their day. And they say, look, it doesn't matter what you do to us. We are confident because we know that this was going to take place. We knew that we were going to be here someday. And we knew that if the waters came and the flood came, our God was going to rescue us. And if we had to walk through fire, we would not be burned. But even if our God doesn't rescue us, we still will not budge. They weren't going to bow down. And I would think they would also be knowing this because what was so key to the Jews was the Torah, the first five books of Moses. And one of the top two of the ten commandments that were given, the first one is this in Exodus 20, verses 3, and in verse 4. It says this, it says, You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the waters below. In verse 5, you shall not bow down to them or worship them. Now what's amazing is these guys, they could probably smell the smoke from the fire. And in the midst of a time when they could have come up with all kinds of excuses, they didn't. They stayed true to their faith. You see, true faith doesn't look for loopholes. It obeys God at his word every time. And I think that, that sometimes we get caught up in, in the things of this world and, and we get so pressured in some situations that we want to just try to find the loopholes. And true faith doesn't look for loopholes. True faith doesn't just bend it. Well, I'm just really just a little bit. I'm just kind of dabbing a little bit. I'm just kind of doing a little bit. True faith obeys God at his word 100% of the time. And that's the target that, that God challenges us to live for and to go for. Not bending it. Not twisting it. And as we kicked off this series, we talked about how we live in a culture that wants to make right wrong and wrong right and twist the word of God. That's what Satan's been doing since the very beginning. And God simply wants us to trust him, even when we don't understand what's going on, and that he'll be with us when we go through the fire. He'll be with us when we go through the waters. 
True faith obeys the Lord and trusts him in every circumstance. And so the second thing I just want to suggest is really where the question is this. What do you need to refuse to bow down to? Because I think every one of us, there's, there's probably this little place in my heart where, where I've just not completely surrendered it to God and I'm not really completely willing to bow, you know, or I'm willing to bow to it rather than trusting God and standing up when the rest of the world is giving in and bowing down. And so what is one area you need to refuse to bow down to in your life and to stand up when the rest of the world is blending in? Even in the church today, we tend to blend in with the rest of the world. And it really comes down to just asking, who is it that really has first place in our lives? When the heat is on, we tend to run. We tend to bow. So what is an area we need to not bow down to, refuse to bow down to, and to trust God in? The rest of the story goes on. Daniel 3, verses 19 through 30. It says this, it says, Nebuchadnezzar was so furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that, that he, that his face became distorted with rage. I mean, you ever been around somebody like that? I mean, they're just, ah, you know, he's just, this guy's just, he, he's just, just messed up. And he commanded that the furnace be heated seven times hotter than usual. You ever tried to heat something up seven times more than it's already heated? I mean, it's just kind of, it's a ridiculous statement is really what it means. There's no way he's going to heat something up. I mean, you might be able to make it hotter, but you're not going to make it seven times hotter. You know, but here he's like, we're going to heat this thing up seven times hotter than usual. Get this thing going. Verse 20, then he ordered some of the strongest men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. Verse 21, so they tied them up and threw them into the furnace, fully dressed in their pants, turbans, robes, and other garments, and because the king, in his anger, had demanded such a ridiculous, I might insert, a hot fire in the furnace, the flames killed the soldiers as they threw the three men in. Now let's just pause here for a moment. I think it's a good lesson we can learn from this. Sometimes it's easy to lose control. And in our anger, in our foolishness, in our stupidity, when we act out, other people get hurt in the process. And here, Nebuchadnezzar, he is just out of control. And he is not thinking about anybody but himself. And it's clear here that because of that, it cost some of his key men their lives. Because he was so wrapped up in himself and he had such an incredible rage. He demanded that that fire be so hot that it killed the guys even trying to put these guys who have been loyal to him. I mean, it's just a ridiculous thing. Because he's so focused on himself. These guys died as they were putting them into the fiery furnace. Verse 23. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, securely tied, fell into the roaring flames. But suddenly, Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in amazement and exclaimed to his advisors, Didn't we tie up three men and throw them into the furnace? Yes, your majesty, we certainly did, they replied. Verse 25. Look, Nebuchadnezzar shouted, I see four men unbound, walking around in the fire, unharmed, and the fourth looks like a god. Another translation will say a son of God. Now some scholars suggest that this is possibly the incarnate, um, the pre-incarnate Christ. Before Jesus was incarnate and took on humanity, that this could have been Jesus. Other scholars say, well, it just really could be an angel. Either way, God was with them as he promised Prior to their being born through the prophet Isaiah, that as they went into the fire and through the fire, that he would be with them. Verse 26, then Nebuchadnezzar came as close as he could to the door of the flaming furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out here. <laughs> come here. I mean, now he's recognizing who's really in charge, right? Say, come out. Come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stepped out of the fire. Then the high officers, officials, governors, and advisors crowded around them, and they saw that the fire had not touched them. Not a hair on their heads was singed, and their clothing was not scorched. They didn't even smell of smoke. Now, I don't know about you, but that's pretty amazing that about 100 years difference between Isaiah's prophecy and the book of Daniel, that what God promised 
came to pass. And when we firmly stand and believe and live out our lives on the word of God, God will hold true to his word. And these guys didn't bow. They didn't give in. They didn't try to twist it. They didn't try to justify it. They simply obeyed God at his word, and they were not touched. They didn't even smell like smoke. Now, how many of you ever sat around a campfire, and then when you go into a house, you're like, man, or you ever went to a restaurant where somebody was smoking, which doesn't happen much anymore, but then you come out and you smell like cigarette smoke? I mean, these guys didn't get touched, and they didn't even smell like smoke. Verse 28. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent his angel to rescue his servants who trusted in him. They defied the king's command and were willing to die rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make this decree. <laughs> this is what I love about Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> this guy just doesn't back down. Therefore, I'm making a decree. <laughs> If any people, whatever their race or nation or language, all the people I've conquered, whatever language you speak, against the word of the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they will be torn limb from limb. <laughs> and their houses will be turned into heaps of rubble. There is no other God who can rescue like this. Even in the midst of revelation, he is still exhorting his power. Here's the deal, guys. I'm still on the throne here. <laughs> But if anybody doesn't worship their God, you will be torn in pieces. Verse 30. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to even higher positions in the province of Babylon. All because they were not willing to bend one bit. Not one little bit. So the last thing I just want to close with is this. Point three. It's another question. Are you willing to go through the fire? Are you willing to live out your faith in such a way that you're willing to go through the fire? Now, that's a hard question to answer. Because theoretically, we, we want to obey. We want to do this. But if we're really honest, sometimes when the heat is on, we want to give in. It's so hard sometimes. But the real question is, are we willing to go through the fire? Because when you turn in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, and you read the whole hall of faith of all the men and women that have gone before us, a lot of them never saw what they were promised. Okay? They're, they're in eternity with God, seeing the fulfillment of it. But they didn't see it in their life. But they weren't willing to back down. They fully trusted God at his word. And because of that, they are in the hall of faith. Because they were faithful to God at his word. Peter writes this. The apostle Peter, he's writing to a church that's under fire. A church where there's extreme persecution taking place. People are being burned at stake. People are being killed. And this is what Peter writes. He, he says this. He says, these trials, you know, just, just ignore them. Just go do what you want. He doesn't pamper them. He says, he says, these trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests pure and purifies gold. Though, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. What's interesting when you read from cover to cover of God's word, he never once moves his people away, away from the fire. Because God is more concerned about our holiness and purifying us than he is about our happiness. Because he knows what's best for us and he simply wants us to trust him. To trust him at every point and let him take us through the fire. He is with us through the fire, even though we don't understand it at times because he's doing something greater in us to make us into his image. That we will reflect the very nature and the character of God in our lives. Not living out our image, but being image bearers of the true king. So a couple bullet points I have here on this last point. Are you willing to go through the fire? First bullet point is this. Don't go through the fire alone. These guys, when you read in this story, Daniel, last chapter, he went to them and said, guys, get on your knees and start praying. Or our lives, are, are, they're, in, they're in trouble. Get on your knees, start praying. Ask God to reveal this dream. These guys lived in biblical community. They were connected with each other consistently. That's how they lived, even in exile, even away from their homeland, a thousand miles away, they connected with each other and they stood out above everybody else. Don't go through the fire alone. Your God is with you 
and you need other people with you along the way. Matthew 18, 20, Jesus promises this. He says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I with them. Or two or three gathered in my name, there am I with them. Jesus promises when we meet together, we're connected with each other, he is with us. Next bullet point. When the fire comes, the fire, it burns off the things that holds you back. Now let's notice what's back. Let's go back here and look at verse 25 again. Nebuchadnezzar, he says, look, Nebuchadnezzar shouted, I see four men, what? Unbound. Walking around in the fire, unharmed, and the fourth looks like a god. The only thing that got burned while they were in the fire was the things that held them back. That's it. And God wants to burn off all the junk in our lives that's holding us back from the fullness of all that he has in store for us. If we're willing to trust him and be willing to go through the fire, it'll burn off the things that hold you back. Last thing, last bullet point is this. It proves who is still on the throne. You see, what we don't realize in this chapter, some scholars believe at this point in time, the temple a thousand miles away was destroyed. Nebuchadnezzar, he exerted his power, says, these gods, these other lands are nothing. He destroys the temple. It doesn't matter. Even if it wasn't destroyed at this point in time, these guys were nowhere near their place of worship. But they knew their God was with them. And regardless of what the king said, they knew who was still ultimately on the throne. He never left the throne. And our Savior has never left the throne. Our God is the one that's on the throne. And he challenges us to say, who's really on the throne? And when we go through the fire, it really begins to reveal who's really on the throne. Because when I start squirming when the heat is on and I run, then really it shows that I'm on the throne. But when I'm willing to go through the fire and let it purge and purify me, God reveals that he is on the throne. Let's go back and look at Isaiah. Wrap up with this. Isaiah 66, it says this. This is what these guys, I think, had going on in their head. It says this. This is what the Lord says. Heaven is my throne. Now, the temple was still up at this point in time. And God's saying, here's the deal. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house you will build for me? Where will my resting place be? In other words, what God is saying, look, it's not in a building. I created all these things. I created them for you. My resting place is not in one place. And we fast forward to the New Testament. And the New Testament says, where is the temple of God? You, as a Christ follower, are the temple of God. And it challenges us to be careful what we do with this temple and what we allow into this temple where the Spirit of God resides. What do you need to refuse to bow down to? Are you willing to go through the fire to let Jesus be Lord of your life? Are you promoting your image for people to see all around the world? Are you promoting the image of the one true God who paid the ultimate price for you? Let's pray.